Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we were singing that song, I inquired about what was really going on and I was told, more like I was reminded, the Lord's been dealing with me in the last couple of days on the issue of being double-minded. Again, the issue of being double-minded has to do with, very fundamentally, has to do with your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. So think about it, your conscious mind represents the, the mind that is very active in the physical world. The mind that can interpret the temperature in the room, the emotions of, of pain, of happiness, of satisfaction, of disappointment. But there is another mind, which is the mind of your spirit, a mind that is deeper than the depths of your consciousness. And to be double-minded means to be one person here on earth and a different person right in front of your heavenly father. Remember that the you that is a new creation is currently in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the father. And the Bible says the one who sits in the heavens laughs. And so when you're going through difficulty and you're crying, your spirit is laughing because your spirit already knows that all things work together for your good. And so, the Lord's been dealing with me concerning double-mindedness. And when we were singing that song, Bless His Holy Name, what I saw was that our human or our spirits, our new creation spirits that are in the presence of God, are blessing God's holy name because He has already done great things. Even though the very instance of us that is trapped in time hasn't recognized it yet, but by faith we declare that he has done great things so that we are not double-minded, but we are in agreement by faith with what God has already done in heaven. His word is forever settled in heaven, so bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Oh, we bless your holy name, oh God. He's the great things. Hallelujah. All that is within me. Bless his holy name. Father, we worship you. We give you praise. Hallelujah. God is good. Alrighty. That is it. Let's be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you guys. Come on. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has done great things. give you praise because you have done great things. Sibarabos, 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 yes, Sibarabos, yes, Sibarabos, Marabas, Peturubos, Pialabas, Sibarabos. Yebababababalos, Merelelelelegonga, Yalamas, Umderialabosa. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to just do you a favor real quick. Um, because I was in the treasure storehouse in heaven. And the very first thought that came to my mind was, man, I don't want to just come out of this place without taking something for someone. The same thing happened on Saturday. What day is it today? This is Tuesday, right? Yeah, on Saturday... The same thing happened and I knew that I needed to come out of where I was with a souvenir, with something for somebody. And then as soon as I came up here, even before I came up here, the Lord said to me, how about healing? Is healing going to work? I said, okay, I think that will do. Someone can use, uh, you know, the healing miracle. And you saw what happened in here. 
the testimonies started immediately and they've been coming in after that. I know some people who have already checked in with my wife and I concerning some of the things that the Lord has done for them even from that very moment. And we, we received the testimony immediately of our sister Z who came up immediately testifying of what God has done. And so again, I found, my, found myself in the treasure room and it was indeed the company of innumerable angels. And you think Anita can sing. Oh, wait until you see Anita being backed up by angels. Come on. Praise God for Anita and Diamond. Where, where are they? Praise God. But on Saturday, Alan said, it wasn't just us singing in here. Don't worry. We're going to keep singing that even though we look crazy until people can audibly hear it in this place. It's coming. I'm not in a hurry. Like I've told you, you see, when God is doing a thing, we don't have to worry about the speed of the manifestation because faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. The people who get ahead of God are the ones who get left behind. Yeah, because the reality of it is God begins a thing from the end thereof. So if you get ahead of God, what you're doing is you're going backwards. And so I'm not in a hurry, you know, I've been saying these things for years. I remember when God called us and told us, you know, to start communion house. Uh, there was a gentleman who said to me, he said, he said, when the miracles, he specifically put it this way. He says, when the revival starts that God is telling you to go and prepare for, he says, let us know, we'll come. <laughs> and I smiled and I thought to myself, this goon thinks he's doing me a favor. When God speaks to a man to come out of his father's house and from his kindred, himself and his household to be made separate for the work of the ministry, you better know that it is in your interest to align yourself with the word of God. But unfortunately for him, a lot of what he's seen and bought into is ambition in ministry. So he thought I was just another ambitious guy who wants to go and have a church. Because there were people who could not understand or bring themselves to understand that we literally were leaving a mega church system wherein we were doing well at planting churches to go to the basement of our house in the name of answering the call. They couldn't, they couldn't comprehend it so they concluded within themselves and unfortunately, some of the people who were spreading the untruth were seen by people like my, the gentleman, I wouldn't call him my friend, because you see your friends tell something about you. But this other dude bought into the narrative of the elders who said, oh Moses, he wants to go and start a church himself and Rosemary, they want to go start a church. And I said, no, we're not going to start a church because a church is a building. So if you think we're going to go get a building, don't, don't expect that to happen. We are going to answer the call. And the guy was like, I'm sure he's been waiting somewhere, checking us out on Facebook and saying, well, I haven't seen the revival yet. They're not baptizing people with a long line from here to the next block. You know, because people have chosen. One of the very first things that God told us he specifically said to me, tell your brothers and sisters that I bring around this work to have an understanding of what revival really is. Because Jesus says in the last days, many will come in my name and they will say to you, we have seen the Savior. We have seen the Messiah. He says they will invite you to come out to the wilderness, some to the desert. Some would ask you to come to the waters to say that we have seen him. He says, but by their fruits, we shall know them. If a so-called revival is not producing fruits of intimacy with God. Then it is yet another show that the enemy is orchestrating as an angel of light to distract people from their closet and from intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And so some people are still waiting, but I am not in a hurry because the true manifestation of what God has called us to do is described in Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says it's not going to be a show. 
the author of Hebrews, he says, we have not come to a mount that might be touched. We have not come to that kind of experience on Mount Sinai that many mistook for a show, but we have come to the company of innumerable angels, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That is the kind of experience that we are looking for. We are not about to put up a sign in front of our church saying, oh, this is a place for imperfect people. No, we are just men made perfect and we will bear the fruits of perfection in the name of Jesus and by the glory of the same. But I tell you what, some people are busy waiting to see a show, but before they, if they wait any longer, they will miss the train. Jesus promised us one thing. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, they were waiting for a show because they're like, it's never rained. So we're going to wait until it starts raining. But God knew what he was doing before we started raining. He shut the door. So those people cannot change their minds when God's timing is over. And so I say to you, my very skeptical friend, you know who you are. You and the company of your disillusioned ambitionist this is the final warning that the Lord has given to you it's better for you to get in the water now than to wait until you see a show because the kind of show that is about to be put up will be put up after the doors are shut because the Lord is doing a thing I have seen it and my prayer is that others get to see it too and it is coming but guess what as much as I am eager I am not in a hurry because you know what happens to people that are in a hurry? Satan gives them a counterfeit. If you go in a hurry and you cannot wait for God, Satan will give you something to worship. Anyway, let us, um, let's, let's keep going. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Alrighty, I think the band is waiting for me to read one scripture and pray before they come off. But maybe that's a... Uh, we're running a different schedule today, so when you're ready to transition, please feel free to transition. Praise the Lord. So, I'm going to tell you a couple more things on that subject. You see, the reason why I'm saying that we cannot be in a hurry, because to be in a hurry is to attempt to take the place of God. Because God is never late. Because he is the one who is the author and the finisher. And so who am I to say, God, you're late. Okay, did he tell me that he was going to do it yesterday? The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. When, when what's his name? Um, Lazarus. When Lazarus died, people thought Lazarus could have lived if Jesus had not appeared late remember eventually when Jesus came um, one of the sisters of Lazarus paid Jesus a courtesy visit before Jesus even made it to town almost like in the way of letting Jesus know how people should respond when there is an emergency she kind of went there to show Jesus that when there's an emergency you don't drag your feet you hurry up look I couldn't even wait for you to get in I came to visit you just in case where you come from Jesus people take their sweet time she came and she was like, it's all right, you know, it's, it's all right, Jesus. I'm glad you came anyway, but you know, it's kind of too late now. If you had been here, my brother would have lived. But then, the impatience and the hurriedness of those who cared about Lazarus would only have resulted in diminishing the testimony that the man of God eventually had. I know so many people who have expressed concern over my wife and I because of the fact that 
they were around before we started communion house and they've been waiting for us to start a church so that they can come and speak for us so that they can come and preach here so that they can tell their friends that you know Moses and Rosemary we knew them when they were running around just as little children when they were little children in the marketplaces and now we thank God for what God is doing in their lives in fact I spoke for them the other day it was a room full of people you see I have heard such disappointments expressed in my face and behind my back one time too many <laughs> and every time I smile I say because if the Lord is working by your schedule at best I would just be like you at best my testimony would not be different from yours you see but God forbid that the word of God that he gave to me fall to the ground without being fulfilled because when I was about the age of 12 years old and I had an experience of going in a trance the very first time that I was completely out in the spirit not knowing where I was I woke up and I was trying to recoll recollect where I, where I had been. I knew that I had been in a place. I had seen things, but it just wasn't coming to me. And so I sought the Lord. I said, just give me something. I knew I was somewhere. The entire church left and went home. And I was still here on the floor for the sake of the lady who stayed there. The, 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 the Sunday school teacher who stayed back speaking in tongues because she didn't know how to report to my parents that the little kid they sent to Sunday school fell and was still breathing, but not moving, not conscious. So she was there praying. All the other kids had gone home. They had checked them out. I said, for the sake of all of that inconvenience, give me something. And he said to me, he says, the more you give yourself to the leading of my spirit, I will do in your life the unprecedented. And I believe that that is the will of God for every single one of us because we are made in his image and in his likeness. And he calls us a generation of peculiarities. Every single one of us is peculiar. God wants to do through you and in you something that has yet to be seen before. But there are people whose mission in life is to ensure that you succeed at being ordinary. They are so determined to see you succeed at being ordinary ordinary doing exactly what they have done so that they don't have to feel bad I remembered when I was in my third year at the university I had a black silk shirt and I would wear it with a pair of black jeans and a pair of Kenneth Cole shoes and whenever I wore that people would call me the mask of Zorro <laughs> do you remember that movie the mask of Zorro Mr. Bendaris and men everywhere that I went to, even if it wasn't windy, my silk shirt was shaking because I was as skinny as a toothpick. So when you're skinny and you put on a silk shirt, it's recipe for attention. Because any little wind, even if someone is breathing heavily around you, your shirt is shaking. And then I would assist the shirt by opening up my arm so that they know the mask of Zorro has arrived in all black. I didn't know that one of my friends was really jealous. So one day he was at my house and I was ironing that shirt and the iron got too hot and decided to make a hole in the shirt. Oh yeah, it was a terrible day. But the Lord set me free because I was getting obsessed with that shirt. I believed in that shirt more than the anointing. I felt like once I wore that shirt, I was invincible. I was literally Zoro when I wore that shirt. And then as soon as the iron, the pressing iron decided to make a triangle like the pyramid of Gaza, or Giza, whatever they call it, on my shirt, my friend looked and he saw it and he was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I was like, what do you mean? He says, now I don't have to be jealous anymore. He said it jokingly, but in reality, I learned that there are times when people do not want you to become so different that they may have to be jealous of you. And some people actually do mean well because they can't imagine waiting for as long as you have waited to see the full manifestation of what you said God said can I say that again like broken down some people cannot fathom waiting for as long as you've had to wait so genuinely for your sake they want your miracle to happen now because they feel sorry for you but then the God who gave me the word knew what he put on the inside of me. He knows that he's put something inside of me 
The Bible says that it is God that is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So thank you, friends and family, for your concern. If you can no longer wait, change the channel. But by the time the Lord is done doing what he is doing, the Bible says Gentiles will come to my light and kings to the brightness of my shining. Because at the end of the day, I am not on any man's clock. I am on heaven's divine timing. Because let me tell you something, when we were growing up, my mom would always say to us that whoever does what no one's ever done will see what no one's ever seen. And I would say that in reverse, that whoever wants to see what no one has ever seen must be ready to do what no one has ever done. We celebrate Abraham today. Why? Because he was called a Hebrew. Do you know what a Hebrew means? A Hebrew means the one that has crossed the river. When Abraham showed up and they knew that he was a Sumerian, everybody wondered how did he get here? Because they knew that it was one of the most difficult things to cross the Tigris or the Euphrates. Because the Tigris is essentially a part of the Euphrates. So when they saw him, they had to give him a name. The, the term Hebrews was a way of saying, man, you're weird. <laughs> because where you're coming from, everything seems to be going well. The reports that reach us from the kingdom of Nimrod is such a good report that we don't even know why you would leave that place. But you braved it all by yourself. It was very non-customary for those people to leave all by themselves. If they would move, they would move in a crowd. You know why? Because Nimrod had the most number of enemies. And so the people who served in his court, like Abraham's father, never moved alone. They never did because if you have that many enemies, you dare not move alone. People were waiting everywhere. Eventually when Nimrod was shot by Esau, it was because Esau was in the weirdest place possible because these people did not reveal themselves unless they felt safe and comfortable. And then suddenly Abraham shows up without his, with his face uncovered, with his accent very strong. They knew where he was from. They had to give him a title. They called him a Hebrew. Because it's like, dude, how did you get here? Let me tell you something, the morale of that story is this. If we are not willing to go the extra mile to allow for God to be done with us, cooking and forging this new thing that he wants to do we will be like everybody else but if we would be patient with God's program it might take long it might take 50 years to see the promise fulfilled but let me tell you something God never lies he says as the rain comes down from heaven that does not return Without having watered the ground, so is every word that proceeds from my mouth. It would not return to me void. So I want to encourage you, stay with God, stick with his program. It doesn't matter what your body clock is saying, stick with his program. It doesn't matter what your societal clock is saying, stick with his program. Everybody that you know may have gotten married 10 years ago, but stick with his program. Everybody that you went to business school with might have become a millionaire and you are still here writing proposals, stick with his program because what God is getting ready to unveil in your life by the time it happens, you will be as the one that has been truly dreaming. You know, the Bible says that when the Lord turned around the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamt. Literally, what it means, we, we, our, we, all of our dreams became our reality. We were living as though we were still dreaming. You understand what I mean? You know, all things are possible in your dream. You don't even want to know what kinds of things that I've done in my dream. But the Bible says a time would come wherein all of that fantasy will be a modest reflection of my reality. Because God has promised to do exceedingly abundantly above what I ask or imagine. But what I was telling you that happened in the presence of God was this, I said, Lord, I want something to take with me. And the Lord said to me, let them see what's in the bag. I saw people, children of God, holding little sacks and they just couldn't wait because it wasn't time for them to bring it out. 
but they were so eager. They were like little children, so eager to open it. And the Lord says, that's where some of your brothers and sisters are. They are so eager. They cannot wait anymore. He says, but I will give them a glimpse today of the glory that is ahead. Praise the Lord. The Lord is giving you an opportunity. The Lord has given you an opportunity to catch a glimpse of what he has for you. Yours may come in the course of the service. Yours may have already happened. Yours may happen when you are sleeping, when you are dreaming, but the Lord wants you to see it so that you can be re-energized. You know, because we don't have to pretend sometimes. When we're tired, we're tired. You see, I don't have to impress God by saying, God, look at me, I'm not tired. And God is like, oh, you are? Because God never promised that you will not be tired. He says, you will be renewed. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The reason why they will run and not be weary is because their strength is being renewed. You see what I mean? But quite often we want to impress God, like, oh God, you know me, I'm still strong, I'm good to go. And then as soon as God turns his back, you're like, <laughs> because God never turns his back. You're just the one who thinks it's okay for you to not be honest. You see, God knows that it is okay for you to be tired. And that is the reason why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. When God gives you an opportunity to catch a glimpse of the glory that is about to be revealed. When Jesus was tired, how was he strengthened? Jesus was really tired. And he told his father, he was like, at this particular point in time, we might as well just choose another plan. You're the master planner. Come up with something else. He says, he says Father, if you will, let this cup pass over me. It wasn't Matthew who said that. It was the Lord Jesus. The one that was said to us, the Messiah that will come from eternity and remain for eternity. The one who has been from the beginning. The one who is called the beginning and the end. Got to the point where it's like, I don't sin enough now. And it's not looking good. But thank God he didn't say it out. But he said, with, he said to the Father, let this, if you will, with all due respect, let it pass over me. That was to let you know that he was tempted in every way as we are tempted. But rather than giving in, he says, but not my will, but yours be done. And later on, it was revealed to us that at that particular point in time, what the father did was the father just showed him a picture from a few days later. <laughs> because where Jesus was, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. And all he could see at that particular point in time was the cross. And when he tried to push beyond the boundary of Golgotha, all he could see was hell. Remember that Jesus was several days in hell. All he could see was all the armies and the hordes of darkness that would come against him. And he was like, wow, okay. I knew that I signed up for this, but maybe some details were hidden. You know, because God operates like that. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search it out. If kings have to search it out, how much more the king of kings? And so, not all the details were revealed. There were fine prints. And so when Jesus was getting tired, when all he could see was the cross, and then eventually hell, he was like, uh, can we reconsider this plan? I mean, like honestly, and you know what the father did? The father was like, I see where you're coming from. How about if you saw what would happen in seven days? And when the father showed him the future, the Bible says Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, to set something before you is to give you a presentation. 
is to cast a vision, is to give you a display. And for the joy that was set before him, the Bible says he endured the cross, despising the shame. Not only was he going to the cross, he went to the cross gallantly. He went to the cross like a Jamaican warrior, bouncing as he went to the cross. Bring it on because I have seen the future. If you're, if you're a Jamaican, I love you, but Jesus loves you more. And so I'm telling you when the father says that he's going to give you a glimpse of the glory. That is all the power that you need. Because that joy was the strength that enabled him to pray. And not only was he fired up after that, he became an encourager of other people. He was able to say to others, come on, come on guys, let us pray. But they didn't see what he saw. So they were like, man, dude, we don't know where you get all that energy from, Jesus. We'll be walking all day. We're still struggling with the sadness of the potential of you leaving us. We want to sleep. But I tell you what, sometimes when the people around you are no longer as supportive as they need to be, just ask God to show them what you have seen. You could do that. When Gehazi was no longer as supportive of Elisha as it should be, Elisha was enjoying himself in the face of opposition because the man of God just don't care. Because he knows how much he is cared for. If you know, Jesus says, if you know how much you are cared for, you will no longer care. He says, you are of more value than many sparrows. Why worry? And so Elisha was no longer getting support from Gehazi. Gehazi that was, going to be, that was supposed to be his hype man. That was his primary assignment to hype the man of God. Because Elisha was not very popular. He was an awkward fellow. And he was just fortunate by God to have at least one person who believes in him. And that same person who believes in him started to panic. Started to believe everything that was going on on social media. He started to believe in all the opposition. Gehazi looked at their bank account and it was like, this ministry is not going anywhere. How do I know that? You remember that it was same Gehazi who followed Naaman. I said, my master is being humble and being overly spiritual. Oh yeah. Gehazi followed Naaman and he says, you wanted to bless our ministry. But the man of God says, we don't need the money. He says, the man is just being overly humble and overly spiritual. I, as an agent of the ministry, I will take the dough. It's in your Bible. It sounds, like, it sounds like something out of Netflix TV series. But in reality, Gehazi followed Naaman because Gehazi knows that they have a need. He sees the ministry bank account. He knew that the man of God possibly had nothing to eat that night. And here is a Syrian general who brought all kinds of precious things. And the man of God is like, no, all I need is the auction. I, all I need is a word from God and I got two. So who needs mammon? But Gehazi was like, at the end of the day, I'm the one he's gonna send to go and buy bread. And he'll be quoting scriptures telling me, go and buy you who have no money. <laughs> People will come at you with legitimate reasons to be concerned on your behalf. Some people have missed their destiny because they took the place of God in your life. They acted as though they cared for you more than God cares for you. If God has called the man, you better believe that God is with the man that he calls. There are faces that we used to see here that we don't see no more because they were a bit more concerned about me than God is. God is like, he'll be fine, he'll be okay. And they're like, I don't think so. We don't think so. You know, if people keep living like that because he keeps talking about the end time and he keeps speaking so harshly and keep prophesying to their faces of what they did before they got to church, we're not gonna have money to keep the doors open. And God is like, uh, you didn't call him, I called him. And they're like, God, God, you're being too, you know, some people thought that God was being too casual about this ministry. And they took it very personal. But here we are today. The light is still on. And the march is still on. Let me tell you something. The Bible says do not be overly righteous. Why destroy yourself? Do not be overly wise. Why die before your time? It's in the Bible. Do not be overly righteous. Why destroy yourself? If you think you can be more righteous than God, the God who called me, he said to me, he says, my righteousness comes from you. So just you do as I have sent you. Do not worry. 
yourself about this or that. The Bible says, I believe in Isaiah 54 verse 27, that the righteousness of God's people, of his messengers, come from him. But some people think you're not doing things right enough. You're not taking offerings enough. You're not begging for tithes enough. You're not visiting people enough. You're not doing counseling enough. You're not pampering people enough. I'm like, no, whatever I do by the leading of the Holy Spirit is enough. I beg your pardon. It's more than enough. Because my God is more than able to make the five loaves and two fish feed the entire revival. If Jesus attempted to do a revival for three days without feeding people today, by the end of that first day, it would be just him, Peter, James, and John. A revival without coffee? Say that again. <laughs> a, a man of leader, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, man of leader is like Peter. In fact, you haven't noticed. Yeah. Man of leader is like Peter. She's ready to go at the word of the Lord. You see? And even if the Lord is not speaking quick enough, you know, some people have this ass to say, I think this is where you want to say, Jesus, let's go. But that's not man of leader, though. She's better than Peter in that regard or different from Peter in that regard. So, I tell you what, Gehazi, pray for these two. Let's pray for them. Yeah. I tell you what, See, this is what Zoe has done. <laughs> Gehazi, she said that's why she doesn't sit in the front. Gehazi was unable to support Elisha because he wasn't seeing what Elisha was seeing. Father, I thank you because this is not the wisdom of man, but this is the leading of your Holy Spirit. I didn't even know the Lord had this for us in today's sermon. When I was standing there, what I was praying for, when we took that second song and y'all started to sing, I knew that we were not the only ones here because I was somewhere else. I came into the room where we were worshiping. I heard those voices and I begged God. I was going to beg God and it was literally in that moment that I thought to myself, wait a minute, why ask God when I can ask these same people here, the angels, to just appear? So I said to them, guys, do you mind showing yourself here? And they said, we will when the time comes. But I was there in that very moment. I would do things like that just to verify that I am actually where I am. Like Paul said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. So sometimes I will engage with what I'm seeing in the vision just to be sure that I'm actually there. And so I asked, I said, please, let this once receive something from this treasure house. And I am, and that was what I asked that the Lord will show you what I am seeing. Because there are times wherein the journey would appear long because of what God is doing. And the ones who have come along as the Lord has commanded may be getting tired. And may be feeling like, really, did God really call this person like he says? Because where are the results? But like I told you before, I am not running a race for results. I am working this field for a reward. Because results are fleeting, but reward is eternal. The result is to have a following. The result is to sell books. The result is to be on TV. The result is all of those things that men can give, but the reward is that which only God can give. Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me. So that means Jesus reserves the right to reward me. You understand what I mean? And so that is the reason why it is very beneficial for all of us to see the same thing so that we can be on the same page. Even if we don't see to the same degree, we all need to catch a glimpse of the glory so that we stay steadfast, so that we are not like the 500 that became 120 before the Holy Spirit came. How many days was it? 40 days thereabouts? From the time Jesus was taken up in front of them, the Bible says 500 men were there upon the Mount of Olives as Jesus was being beamed up into that cloud. And the angels told them, the way you have seen him go, he is coming. Now do what he said. He said, go and wait for me in Jerusalem until you have received power. And within 40 days, 500 people, 500 registered waiters were reduced to 120. Imagine if you were the number 121. And then all you have is a secondhand experience of what happened. It would take the grace of God for you to forgive yourself. These were, these were the same people that were persecuted when Jesus was being prosecuted. These were the same people that celebrated his resurrection. The same people that have been testifying of his goodness, 
of the glory. To the point wherein they made other disciples. Did Jesus not just appear first to the ladies, a handful of them, and then to the, to the 11, and eventually again to the 12? They became 500 because they could not keep their peace. Although some of them, Jesus had to appear to them personally. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. But cut the long story short, there were 500 of them. And within 40 days, they had depleted to 120. Why am I saying all of what I am saying? I know what I am saying. Something is about to happen. And you don't want to be one of those people who get to be cut off just before the glory. You see, Jesus said something. He says, those who lay their hands on the plow and look back, they are not fit for the kingdom. Do not be of them that draw back unto perdition, but be of them that press forward unto the saving of the soul. Judas Iscariot labored in Jesus' ministry for three and a half years, and just three and a half days before resurrection, he hung himself. Three and a half days after three and a half years. So I'm encouraging you, don't be discouraged. Jesus said he's coming and he's still coming. And the kind of revival that we are promised in the word of God is a revival that Jesus described to the Samaritan woman. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, he said, a time is coming wherein you will no longer on this mountain or in some place else, not by this well that was dug by your grandfather, seek the Lord. He said, because the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers that the Father is seeking will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The revival that we anticipate is not a revival that is place-specific or venue-oriented. It is a revival of the illumination of the hearts of men that will result into a multi-transfiguration of a generation of people that will light up the world wherever they go. You will become that ecclesia lamp that will set places on fire. And people don't have to travel to go experience it. They may have to travel to come and see you, but you don't have to go look for it. That is what we were promised. Anything that is less than that, at best is only a warm up. And Jesus didn't say we would have to warm up. He just says we just have to wait. Praise the Lord. So let me say this one more time. What do you do with your picture glory when it gets shown to you? Don't stay there. Okay? Do not stay there. When God reveals or gives you a glimpse of the glory, he expects of you to take that experience and the joy of that insight and keep running toward the fulfillment of the promise. When Jesus saw the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He got up, he was fired up and he told his disciples, wake up. I am now going as it's been written of me in the volume of the books. What was written of him that he will be betrayed in the house of his friend? He knew that that was about to be fulfilled, which meant that the betrayer was about to turn him into the hands of his enemies. That was what was written concerning him. But he went for that experience joyfully, performing miracles along the way. If that was you, they're about to go and completely prosecute and persecute you. And one of the people perpetrating it, their ears get chopped off. You will say, good for you. You got what was coming. You asked for it. You understand what I mean? But Jesus was like, oh, we don't do that here. He picked up the ear and healed the man. Because let me tell you something. Sometimes some of your enemies want to escape the shame that is coming to them. So they, they do things that will chop off their ear so that they don't hear when your glory song is being sung. And Jesus was like, not only will you see it, my friend, you will also hear it. For the son of man, I personally believe, I personally believe that that soldier was there when the sound of the power of the Holy Spirit that rolled the stone away came. Because his ears that were chopped off had been put back so that he can hear it. Because what did they say? When they went, they said, we heard it. When the man, when he came, who rolled away the stone, they said he came to roll away the stone. So they knew that it was a person that came to roll away the stone. Because they heard it and they knew that it was the sound of a person, the Holy Spirit. If his ears had been chopped off, he might have said, I don't know what happened here. No, you see, your enemies will not have an excuse 
they will experience the great glory of God that is rising upon you. And I'm not just talking about that neighbor that you don't like. I'm talking about all of the horde of hell and the powers of darkness that have tried to keep you in oblivion because nobody can put out this light that God has ignited in you. I want to encourage you when you see what God is about to show to you, don't stay there. Don't spend more time sleeping so that you can keep having the same dream again. You understand what I mean? Don't make a blog about it because what's going to happen is you would have a vision and a dream and you'd be like, if people see this on Facebook, oh my God, all the likes, all the love, all the... Do not build a tabernacle about the vision that God is about to show to you. Use all of the juice that is in that experience to keep running. Jesus himself, he knew that the apostles needed help. The disciples needed help. He knew that they needed to have an idea of what was about to happen. So before he went to the cross, he took them to a mountain, which we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And he gave them a glimpse of what's about to happen. The glorified Jesus, the transfigured Jesus before the cross was only a reflection of the glorified Jesus after resurrection. An ascension. They saw him transfigured before their eyes, just like the two dudes who had done the same before him. Moses and Elijah. They had been taken up to heaven. They had gone to the Father. They had been glorified. They had been transfigured. And Jesus showed to them what was coming. And Peter, James, and John, they were like, this is it. We're going to build tabernacles. Three of them, in fact. One for Moses, one for Elijah. Do you know that if, we, if the same thing happens today, right, in Pennsylvania, that there was an experience. One of the things that God's been protecting us from is the carnality of Christians. Certain things that the Lord has revealed to us that will still happen in our meetings, if they happen now, we will be bombarded by so-called Christians who are not seeking the Lord, but seeking a sign. Because Jesus says that they will seek a sign. But because they are such a wicked and a pervert, a perverse generation, he says no sign will be given to them. But they're looking for the sign. And so if the power begins to occur in here before the time of conviction, they will come for entertainment and they'll be emotional about it. They'll be weeping here for many days and they'll still go back home the same. I saw a man once before who was full pastor of the church not too far from here. He said to me, oh, there was a meeting, a revival meeting in town. And I saw the power of God like a blue flame hit the water as people were being baptized. He said, I quickly jumped in the water. I was like, oh my God. He jumped in the water because he saw the flame. Or at least so he claimed. And I was like, okay, but their fruits, we shall know them. One week after that, no food. Two months after that, got worse. And I'm like, okay, so what did this man jump into? The Lord said to make the imaginations of his heart. Do you know that there is something called the power of collective imagination? If we can just make up a story here that is captivating and people fill the room, their collective imagination would allow for them to have goosebumps and see gold dust. Ask Manuelita. You know, Manuelita... Before the Lord redeemed her, she was one of them gold dust people. Oh my God. And then feathers and precious stones. <laughs> it's okay, folks. Let me tell you something. The Lord will protect his work. Gehazi eventually saw the host of heaven and he was able to be to the men of God the help that was needed. And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the eye of your understanding will open, that you may see that which is the true intention of God for those that he has called. Because once you see it, then you will run with it. Do not build a tabernacle around the experiences that you're about to have. The Lord has revealed to me you're about to see and catch a glimpse of the glory that God is about to reveal in your life. And let me tell you something, let it humble you when you see it. Let it work more on your heart than on your emotions. Because if you let it do a perfect work on you, in your heart, guess what's going to happen? Sorry, in you, on your heart, you will be stronger for it. You'll be more resolute. You'll be more humble. And you'll be more ready for the master's use. Let me tell you something, that which has been declared here will not take long 
according to the time of men, it will not take long before you begin to experience the glory. I release upon you the cosmic dust of heaven that creates the images of life and that presents to you a vision of the glory of God that you may know that which the Lord has in store for you. You know, I know the Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God will do for those who love him. But let me tell you something, because he's elevating you to the place of a prophet today, he says, I will not do a thing without revealing it to my servants, the prophet. Today, the Lord has counted you like Saul amongst the sons of the prophet so that you can catch a glimpse for your own joy and for your own strength. And you will not be disappointed because these words are not the words of encouragement. They're not words of encouragement. This is a prophetic declaration over you that I speak not by the gift of the word of knowledge, but I speak to you today from the office of a prophet that your eyes will open and you will see that your joy may be full, that you will receive strength for the next lap of the journey. Receive strength to wait and not leave like those who missed the Pentecost. You will not miss the power that is coming from on high in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for you personally, for those of you who have promises that you have been holding on to, who have desires that you have been seeking the Lord concerning things that are appear to be thorns in your flesh, not really letting you focus. I pray for you that the Lord will grant you divine focus, that even while some of those things may persist, they will no longer have the ability to distract you from seeking the Lord and from focusing on him, because when you seek him and you find him, all these other things will be added unto you. I pray that you will find Jesus before the material, so that the material does not take the place of Jesus. The word of the Lord to you today is that a new heart I give to you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Let's celebrate Jesus, everybody. Mm. Stephanie, aren't you happy you came this week? I mean, if you had come last week, it was awesome too. My wife brought the word and it was great and, and we had some confessions. Well, but I'm just happy that you came this week. You know, because I believe a lot of what we receive today is very specific to what is about to be revealed because God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to miss out on these things. You see, I remember that when I mentioned that even Jesus, he had to receive more details for his joy because the Bible says a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord guides his steps. The Bible says that a man's heart can come up with all the plans, but the Bible says the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. There are certain times wherein the next step may be hidden from you and it bothers you. Let me do you a favor. This is what God expects. He expects for you not to bother about it. You see, just keep rehashing the plan in your mind and say, this is what the plan is. The Lord is taking me from the God most to the other most. That is the plan. I may not know how to get there. I don't even know what I'm going to do tomorrow. But guess what? Every step that is required is of the Lord. So I'm going to just let God think about that while I go about enjoying this image that he has given to me. So don't get bogged down with the details. The Lord is the one in charge of the details. The world tells you that the devil is in the details. No, the Bible says every step, the details are in the hands of your Heavenly Father. That's why they sound overwhelming to you because they're not yours to bother with in the first place. So rest in God and let him lift you high. God bless you. Hallelujah. We're going to wait for the elements to be passed out and we will go ahead and break bread. What a word tonight, y'all. Something to run with just uh, that expectation has just been drawn out of us. So let's, let's go home expecting. Uh, even as the man of God ministered to us, I know uh, plenty of us were picking up on what the Lord is revealing to us at this time. Hallelujah. Y'all, my bread came out broken, but so did his body. Oh, come on, brother. Come on. Uh, come on now. 
That's right. That's true. I'm just trying to get a good grip on it. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for how you've dealt with us this evening, oh God. What a privilege it is to do this thing, oh God, as you have instructed us in remembrance of you. Father, we thank you for the finished work of the cross. Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, help us to press toward the mark. That you strengthen us by your joy. Father, for you sent your son, you saw us and had mercy on us and sent him, O oh God, to die in our place. For his body was broken in our behalf. His blood was shed. And Lord, we take these, the bread and the wine, and we eat in remembrance of you. All glory and honor belong to you. Let us eat and let us drink. Hallelujah. If I, my brother Charles will help us with the offering slide there. We're prepared to worship in our giving. Thank you, sir. And while the details are on the screen, we'll just wait a couple of seconds and we'll go from there. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Lord, we are just <laughs> so excited for what you have done. For indeed, you have done great things. Father, we give you praise for your word is forever settled in heaven. Lord, look upon this offering, these tithes, O oh God, the tenth part of what you have given us, O oh God, and what we have also set aside to give you above that, Lord. And let them be pleasing to you. Let them be sweet smelling, oh God. Let them reach your nostrils and let them move you, oh God. Father, we thank you for this seed that you have given to every sower in this house, oh God. For we know you own the cattle on a thousand hills, oh God. All the silver is yours. All the gold is yours. All the mountains belong to you, oh God. And the precious stones that reside within the caves, Lord, it's all yours. And so, Lord, we give in faith tonight. We give in worship. And Lord, we commit it unto you. Lord, look upon the hearts of your children and have mercy on them. Lord, let your favor surround them as a shield. Lord, we lift these things up to you and we say bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on now. Let's give God praise. Lest as we are... As we have been blessed to uh, receive the word of getting a glimpse into that goodie bag, let's press into it tonight. On our way home, it can start right now, even as the man of God said. I know a lot of us have already gotten a whiff of it. We've gotten a glimpse of, into it. Let's sprint, press into all of the glimpse that he's going to give us so we can continue to press in. Um, tomorrow, we'll be back at it Wednesday, 9 p.m., Instagram Live. Come and pray with us. Come and press in with us, and we'll be back at it Saturday. Everyone have a blessed night.